This is episode 93 of Stand Up. I'm your host, Pete Dominic. Joining me today, comedian Adam Oliensis will talk about what do you do when your kid sneaks out of the house during a pandemic and has a weekend with friends and then wants to come back. A moral dilemma. Comedian Ted Alexandra will join me to talk about his new comedy special, the first special released during the pandemic, about the pandemic, and reviewed by New York Times comedy critic Jason Zinneman. I'll talk to Earther Managing Director Brian Kahn, who is critiquing Michael Moore's dangerous and reckless and lazy new film. But before all that, I'm going to interview my own daughter about what it's like to be in high school, but not in high school because of the pandemic. I'm Pete Dominic. Stand up with me right now. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for being my friend. For supporting me with a paid subscription. If you are, you are an MVP in my life. I thank you for appreciating what I'm doing here and literally buying into it. If you aren't, sign up now at patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. Ever since I started going daily on the show, people have really responded with amazing positive feedback and as well as putting uh, their money where their mouth is. So many new subscribers on Patreon, just five bucks. So please sign up, support me. This is what I'm doing now. This is my job now, bringing you the smartest, most thoughtful conversation with experts and folks like you each and every day. Two to three guests most days, sometimes maybe just one, but usually uh, several on a number of different issues, including today. Very excited about who I've got for you on today's show. Lots to discuss. Of course, the the president continues to have these insane press conferences and attack reporters. He came back out. He couldn't resist. He came back out yesterday. Also, uh, the most undercovered story in my mind is the situation with uh, around Michael Moore's YouTube film. Some of you probably haven't heard about it, but he's made this, I think, dangerous and reckless new film. Brian Kahn of Earther joins me in a moment to talk about that. Also, like I said, I'm just repeating the opening. What am I doing? Adam Oliensis about his daughter escaping the house is 24 years old, so it's kind of a dilemma because what's he going to do? She's an adult. She can't tell her. He can't tell her she can't leave, but he can tell her you can't come back in the house. You might have contracted the virus. Anybody else going through that? And my friend, comedian Tyler Alexandro, is always amazing. I went live with him on Twitter yesterday, and I'll bring you that conversation. Always fun. But before... We get to all that. I wanted to have a little chat with my daughter about what it's like to be in high school during the pandemic. So for the first time ever on the podcast, I bring you my daughter, Ava Dominic. And uh, sorry, I uh, I gave her the good mic. I got a little bit of a. My other mic was not working great, but just here at the beginning, I think I think you'll like it. All right. Here's my conversation with Ava, then Brian Kahn, then Ted Alexander, and then Adam Oliensis. And let's get it started, shall we? Let's do this. Let's keep rubbing. Okay. <laughs> You're moving. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. Don't move. Okay. Stop moving. I won't. I'll stop. The, the mic picks up the, every time you move. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm here with Ava. She's 15, freshman in high school. Or you were a freshman in high school. Are you technically still a freshman? Yeah. I mean, you don't have school. But I still do school. You still do it. You get up at noon. Does everybody get up late, Go stay up late at night, and then get up late that you know? Yeah, like everyone. Is everybody doing the same type of thing, playing video games and FaceTime or yeah. with each other? Yeah. How how many people would you say you'd be on a chat with at one time at most? Um, It's, like, different for everyone. I just have, like, different groups of people that I talk to, usually, like, the most, like, three or four. What's the latest you stayed up, be honest? 4 a.m. Really? Yeah. And you don't have to get up to go to school. You just have a certain amount of work you're supposed to get done during the day? Yeah. Do you miss going to school? Yeah. Why? I um, I just miss, like, interacting with all my friends and, like, the classroom experience. Right now, I'd say, like, like the schoolwork itself, like, I said, like, so many times. Yeah, it's okay. Everybody does your age. Um, this, you're cognizant of it. <laughs> um, 
the schoolwork itself is a lot easier. It's not as much pressure. The regents were canceled. I don't think there's going to be finals. So it's a lot easier to get good grades than it is in real school. And freshman year has been a lot harder than middle school, like a lot harder than I expected. So it's like sort of like a weight lifted for like workload. But as for like hanging out with my friends, it's so hard to just be at home every day doing the same repetitive schedule without any new things. And, like, I've been talking to my friends and stuff on FaceTime, but it's not the same. What is it? When you say it's not the same, I mean, that's, that's obvious. But for you specifically, what is it? Do you just miss just being with them and having them over and going to their places? And I mean, is it just... It, do you really miss it a lot, or is it almost as good to just be able to talk to them the way that you do on the phone, video, FaceTime? Is it, like, almost good? Do you really miss it? Is it like, painful miss it? Yeah. Yeah. It changes up your, like, schedule, and it, there's, like, new things every time you hang out, and obviously there's conversation, but you can do things with each other, too. And it's not just talking and stuff right like party i mean yeah (laughs) (laughs) uh do you also just i mean don't you honestly miss just seeing boys and that whole chase or you know can you flirt and you can't really it's probably hard to meet new people period much less boys have you made any new friends since this started not really i mean how i'm sure people do but it's probably more difficult yeah i mean yeah do you feel like you're missing out on anything because you think about like the seniors or you think about certain athletes in their last couple of years their last season of the sport or prom or you, do you feel like there's an event or an experience yeah. what for dance for me oh your like, dance recital yeah, yeah i'm thinking for school, of school there isn't really anything for seniors but I don't, I know, I was going to do track, but I didn't get to do that and dance, like, the end of the year, like, recital together, and, um, yeah, that's, like, a big part of our year. We always look forward to that, and, like, before we got out of all this, like, before we got into all this stuff, we had dance, like, made recital dances, and... We had all that stuff put together, and now we can't even use it. And right. You had all rehearsed it. Yeah. Do, so let me just ask you one final question, which is, you don't seem too, too upset or down or depressed. You seem pretty even-keeled most days. Like, How much is this affecting you overall? Um, I think I just learned to accept it at this point. In the beginning, it was harder to wrap my mind around it but it's been about it's been over a month now and I'm getting into the routine and yeah it's just not it's just not as hard as I thought it would be but but then again like the repetitive schedules the boredom it does you find yourself yeah. getting pretty bored yeah but other than that like it's pretty it's it's okay is it cool that you get to hang out more with me Sure. <laughs> Thanks for talking to me on the podcast. Of course. All right. Love you. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> okay. You go, well, you go back to what? What are you doing? Fortnite? Yeah. Is that what you're doing? Yeah. I was like, I cannot Fortnite. wait to get out of here and go play more Fortnite. <laughs> right? With yeah. Friends. Yeah. Enjoy. Okay. Bye. All right. There you go. Conversation with my daughter. What do you think about that? How are your kids dealing with? with all of this, especially if they're in high school. Well, especially no no matter what their ages are. How are you dealing with it? Always want to hear from you. Email me, standupwithpete at gmail.com or tweet me or slide into my DMs. Okay, so now I want to talk to Brian Kahn. He is one of my favorite writers when it comes to all things climate, conservation. He's a great journalist, and Earther is a great website, part of the, uh, the Gizmodo family. And Brian Kahn is the managing director there. He tweets at BL Kahn. I talked about several different issues, including Michael Moore's new film. Here's our conversation right now. Stand up 
Okay, here he is joining me right now, one of my favorite writers and journalists on the issues of climate, energy, conservation, and more. He's the managing editor of Earther, and he is on Twitter at BLKahn, K-A-H-N. Brian Kahn, first time on the podcast, joined me a, a, a bunch of times on Sirius XM radio show. Psyched to finally get you on. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, I'm psyched to be here on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Um, how would you describe what you generally write about at Earther, where you're the managing editor? Uh, you know, end of world stuff, nothing too heavy, things like that. <laughs> um, you know, with a little side of conservation and some maybe a few like little rays of hope shining in here and there. But uh, you know, it's it, at times it feels like, yeah, my my beat is the end of the world, which is which is something. <laughs> yeah, you got to have you got to find a good balance for that, Brian, to stay psychologically uh, centered. I mean, we're all trying to find that right now in this craziness. But I mean, this is this is kind of your work every day for years. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, I enjoy a good cup of coffee in the morning and try to unplug a bit at night uh, when I can. But yeah, it's definitely I think that, yeah, we're all discovering that now is the time when we need to balance our feelings of existential dread with, uh, you know, a few things that we need to just kind of keep forging ahead in these trying times. Um, Speaking of these trying times, you have a really important piece, uh, which is titled What the Humans Are the Virus Meme Gets So Wrong. The this idea that we're the problem and, and you can see how much of, of, of the problem that we are, the human species during this pandemic, as nature is starting to return to places it usually hasn't. And as the air is starting to clear, it's it's very flawed and you have a great piece about it. What's wrong with this myth? Well, I think, you know, there are a couple of things that are wrong with it. I mean, one is just this idea that we should be, you know, cheering on the virus, um, that good things are happening. I mean, that to me is, it, it takes humans just completely out of the equation because there are very bad things happening. You know, we have over 50,000 people have died here in the U.S. now. So it's a really, you know, decidedly bad thing in that regard. Um, but it's also a bad thing in the sense that, you know, when we start to look at this idea that we're broken apart from nature, that, oh, nature is coming back and we are the virus, that kind of stuff you know, it shows that people have forgotten the fact that, you know, we are part of nature. Humans live on this planet and depend on the ecosystems and, you know, everything that it, they provide to us as much as, you know, mountain lions that are coming back to Boulder or the dolphins that are swimming in Italy. So I think that when we start to sort of break that bond apart or when we see ourselves separate, it can just lead to some very dark places. Ones where we either, you know, continue polluting because we don't feel like we have any impact on the environment or we're, you know, we just fail to really understand that we actually have a choice going forward, that we can choose to live with nature and heal that relationship. And I think that that's really important if we care about climate change, if we care about wildlife, um, if we just want to have a habitable planet down the road. Yeah, I love the way that you wrote it here, uh, saying that the coronavirus is a we're the virus moment, it kicks all of that, all of these things at the curb. It erases our agency and the fact that this is a moment when more than ever we need to acknowledge our partnership with the planet. I love the the point you make there that it erases our agency. So important. Can you expand a little bit more? Yeah, I think that what we're seeing with the coronavirus, I mean, it's it's an unprecedented crisis, right? And so it's something that was forced upon us by um, you know by this virus. Um, these lockdowns are, are needed to save lives, and so it's not really a planned thing that we plan to do. But we're seeing that. When we do step back um, and, you know, nature's able to kind of come in and, you know, use these human environments, that's a really powerful thing. And to me, it speaks to the fact that if we come out of this and actually make the active choices um, to welcome wildlife, to welcome nature back into the cities or, you know, wherever we, it is that we live, well, that's like a positive step. And I, I see, you know, our relationship with nature is exactly that. It's a relationship. And if, you know, it's, if it's like any marriage or it's like any relationship – um, you know, with friends, if you don't nurture it, it tends to fall apart. But if you nurture it, it can lead to something much deeper. And I think that we've spent a lot of time putting that relationship with nature by the wayside. And it's time to really pick it back up and work on that and make active choices going forward to actually do good by that relationship. And what will, even, will ultimately be good for nature and good for us as humans as well as part of that relationship. Oh, I love the way you describe it. The, just the idea of it being a relationship. I, I really haven't thought about it that way in terms of it being a metaphor for human relationships. But but you also say the way that we put it aside, but I, I, I would, I, of course, that's true. But I would argue you could also say the way that we've replaced it. You know, my kids and their generation of friends have replaced the with nature and outside with screens and inside. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that that in some ways speaks to the fact, though, that, you know, we've seen large corporations, whether it's Apple or whether it's big oil companies, putting these sort of these things in our hands that help sort of take us away from the world um, that's around us and sort of internalize. They make this, you know, sort of focus on this more internal world almost of, you know, us and our screens or us and, you know, I'm trying to look around my, my apartment here and think of other things that I have, like us and just like, oh, I need a new kitchen table. And so it's, you know, our relationship with stuff has become really strong and has become in a lot of ways the focus of, you know, our lives. And a lot of that comes from the fact that we live in this very consumerist society. But I think if we start to refocus away from that, you know, there's nothing that says this is the way it has to be. Oh, I, I see. But I see what you're saying, which is, you know, just it's capitalism in general. And then the screen's constantly telling you what what we used to only see maybe on television commercials and billboards and radio ads, which were ubiquitous then. But still, now the screens are constantly advertising us, telling my daughters, especially the things that they have to have that they need right now. And it's interesting because for me, uh, when I lost my job back in October and I wanted to try to save money as much as I could, I stopped thinking about buying things new. And I should have thought about that even if I was a billionaire because that's the right way to be a conservationist and, and a thoughtful human citizen. But now, uh, that being said, using the internet and using things like Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist and so on to find garage sales and find things used, yes, it's still using a screen, but I just got to say um, I'm using those functions to find things used because they're cheaper and they're way better for the planet. So I just wanted to point that out as a reaction to what you're saying, given the screens, they do help us buy you stuff as well. Yeah. I mean, I think it doesn't have to be an either or thing at the end of the day. Like, you know, it's not like we choose nature or we choose to get the new iPhone or, you know, look at our iPhone constantly. Like it's something that at the end of the day, we just need to put everything back in balance. And I think that what we're seeing, you know, here at least like, you know, we've seen is like people have swung far to one side that we really are thinking about what's the next thing I can buy, you know, fast fashion or the new iPhone or whatever it is. And forgetting, you know, the actual world that we depend on to sort of have, you know, the habitable planet that exists and that we need to keep habitable. And so I think that, you know, at the end of the day, we just need to sort of start to reprioritize the second side of that and find that balance because, you know, I'm not, I'm not a big person that's going to say we all just need to go live in caves and, you know, light fires every night. And that's, that's our entertainment. Um, I think that there's obviously a lot of things that I really enjoy about the modern world and don't want to go away. But I also understand at the same time that we need to be start thinking about these bigger systems more holistically and how we can fix them so that it benefits not just us and our desires, but the entire planet as a whole. Which is why, honestly, that I subscribe a, 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 a great deal to your, your, your work and your career, because that kind of moral idea is at the center, at the focus of all of your articles. I mean, I, I sometimes will have arguments with folks about economics, and I realized, I, actually somebody else helped me realize, that you have to start with someone when talking about minimum wage or tax policy. You have to start with where their kind of moral center is on economics. What what about the planet? What do humans, you know, what do you think they should have to pay for? And, and what should be privatized and so on, which I, I think is really at the center of your work and why I respect and appreciate it so much. And speaking of which, you've got two pieces at Earther uh, about the, uh, the oil markets, the oil industry. One is titled, What the Actual Fuck is Happening with Oil Prices Right Now, which is a great piece and really interesting. And then the, the, the other one, uh, recent one, is Anything Trump Does to Prop Up the Oil Industry Will Fail in the End. And I just share, or retweeted your tweet about a, a picture of late-stage capitalism with all these oil oil tankers just sitting there uh, with nowhere to go. We So what happened? We had this oil war started between the Saudis and the Russians and the uh, oil uh, OPEC nations. And then we've got the, the, the fracking here in the U.S. that has put us in competition with them, but that they hate. So much to discuss before you even get to the pandemic. But oil dropped to a point we've never seen. It went negative. What the hell happened? Well, what ha what happened was a bunch of weird things came together at once. I mean, all the things you just mentioned were kind of swirling in the background. The pandemic hit and basically just put the brakes on oil use around the world. Um, so, you know, without planes or with fewer planes flying around, less oil is needed. With fewer people driving around, less oil is needed. With entire industry shuttered, still less oil is needed. And so, you know, that drop in demand 
in theory, should have been met by a drop in production. But instead, we saw a whole slew of factors play into into what was actually going on the production side. And oil just keeps being produced at normal rates. Only OPEC eventually did agree to drop production. But, you know, we just saw oil continue to continuing to flow into the market like nothing was going on. And so that led to this very weird situation where there was too much oil, no place to store it, nobody to use it. Um, and that led to this huge price crash that we saw where at one point oil was trading at negative prices. So essentially that meant oil producers were paying people to take their oil because they had nowhere to store it. So that led to this very, very bizarre first time in history kind of just that that kind of thing. It's just never happened. And so we're kind of in uncharted territory. It's not to say that the oil industry is now officially dead and you know we're all moving to renewables or the lights are going to suddenly turn off or anything like that. But it really shows that, you know, this pandemic has created a bit of an inflection point where, you know, we're seeing what a shock like this can do to the oil system. We know we need to get off oil and other fossil fuels for the climate. Um, and so in theory right now is is a perfect time for governments around the world to be considering what's their post-oil plan and how do we start to transition to it now so that we don't go through this kind of shock again? Um, and how do we do it in a way that's just so that it doesn't leave workers behind? Because, you know, fossil fuel workers at the end of the day have done an amazing service to society by helping lift people out of poverty, by helping the economy become what it is, all that stuff, like 100% Pro fossil fuel worker, but at the same time, we also have to understand that those jobs are not compatible with a habitable climate, and so we have to figure out how do we ensure those people aren't stuck holding the bag. How do we keep bring them along to this transition to the clean energy economy? So, I guess that was kind of a long answer to like your question of like what the fuck happened with by saying this is what happened and this is kind of where we need to start going soon. Well, I don't know about that. If you go back and listen to how long I talked before I got to that question, I think it was probably uh, deserved. <laughs> um, also, I love that you. Um, make sure to talk about fossil fuel workers and the way that you talk and write about them. A lot of environmentalists don't, and and um, I think it's important to recognize their contribution to uh, to the society, to the economy, while also saying we we've got to help them and replace those jobs uh, with with renewable energy jobs or something else. And so, speaking of which, uh, you're you're keen uh, to write about how the fracking industry was barely making a profit and how now it's it's really taking a hit and now is the time for some of those companies to be sold and and for those families and those people working in that industry to be saved re-educated retrained etc w- what would be the plan you write about this as well it, it, it seems radical it's not radical it just seems radical because no one's really seriously talking about it in my opinion maybe i'm wrong i'd love to be wrong no, I mean, it's. I think that's the thing is it does sound radical because we only kind of understand how the world has worked to this point. And I think that what we're, we're seeing is these systems for how things have worked are starting to break down. And we can try to prop them back up. I mean, there's, you know, the federal government's more than welcome to just throw billions of dollars at the oil industry if they think that's an important priority, um, which it sounds like they do, unfortunately. But I think that the bigger thing is, you know, rather than trying to keep those industries chugging along, it's time to take that money and put it towards, you know, any number of things – to help workers transition out of that industry. So, you know, it's job training. It's working to get uh, orphan wells capped and taking care of cleanup at these sites. It's thinking about, you know, what are the future careers that we need to have and how do we get people to start migrating and working towards those? Um, You know, we've seen what an unplanned decline looks like in an industry. You know, if you look at the coal industry, the collapse that hit there over the course of the 2000s, 2010s, is shocking. Hundreds of thousands, or I think it's about 100,000 jobs lost in the coal industry I, over that period of time. And not to interrupt, so, but I wonder if there's anything, I'm just, I'm, I'm imagining there's a connection, um, been written and researched about the decline of the coal industry in a state like West Virginia and the steep incline of uh, opiate addiction. I would not be surprised. I mean, you're talking about massive job losses in these places where, you know, that was that was the one gig in town, and it was the gig in town that supported all the other little parts of the town, the restaurants, the dry cleaners, the bars, the you know whatever it is. And when you see the coal plant shut down, everything else gets wiped out as well. I mean, we've seen the same thing in the manufacturing industry. When jobs got shipped overseas, these towns in the Rust Belt got hollowed out. And that's a real concern, thinking about these towns and fracking communities um, as well, is that if there's an unplanned decline, if we just say, you know, let's let the market sort of do its thing – at the end of the day, you know, the CEOs from these companies are going to be fine. They're going to skate off with millions of dollars 
they're going to be totally fine. It's the workers that are going to take the hit. And so rather than waiting for us to get to that moment, it seems like now is just absolutely the perfect time to start talking about what should come next and how do we help, you know, not just those fossil fuel workers, but the tens if not hundreds of thousands of jobs and people that live in those communities that depend on that money and those jobs to exist and to have their own livelihoods. So we don't see, you know, a recreation of the Rust Belt in these fracking towns. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, really important and uh, really interesting. Let's. T- I want to talk uh, finally here with you about this new Michael Moore produced documentary titled Planet of the Humans. Um, he is the executive producer. It's directed and narrated by a guy named Jeff Gibbs. And uh, you have a really important piece about it. Our friend Emily Atkin has been researching it as well. Uh, this is a, a, a really upsetting and damaging film, in my opinion, because there's so many errors and and wrongheaded approaches to it and and crazy conspiracy websites and, quote, news outlets like Breitbart and the Heartland Institute, which is the think tank that has supported climate denial, I think probably arguably more than any other, are, are jumping all over this and propping it up. And there's a reason why it was on YouTube, because things that are on YouTube go viral way faster than if they're on iTunes or Netflix or any other paid site. There are a number of issues at play, as you write about in your piece, Planet of the Humans comes this close to actually getting the real problem, then goes full eco-fascism. I'm not sure where to start with you on this, Brian. <laughs> I'm not either because I have a lot of thoughts on it. But, you know, I-, I guess I would say that when a movie like this comes out on Earth Day and the manner it did, I mean, it just feels like what I, – I-, I guess, you know, I said I have a lot of thoughts on this and I can't even put voice to them because there's just so many. But it- it's truly one of the most shocking things that I've seen come out. Um, especially from somebody like Michael Moore, who's endorsed Bernie Sanders and ostensibly is, you know, quote unquote progressive, to put something like this is just absolutely mind bogglingly upsetting and wrong. Um, what is eco fascism? You write about that and talk about it a lot. So it's this idea that, you know, green so there's this growing movement, I guess, called eco fascism. And it's basically this idea that, oh, if we want to preserve the planet, well, you know, we need to limit population or we need to, you know, control who has access to an American lifestyle. And so basically it's you know, it's these environmental concerns, like there's so they're real concerns, right? Like we're really concerned about resource depletion. We are concerned about climate change. But rather than thinking, you know, about addressing the systems that have created these problems, it's about basically just sort of slapping them uh, with a bit of a veneer of racism, essentially, and thinking, you know, how do we have less people on the planet and how do we preserve the lifestyles we have while making sure that other people don't get access to it? And it's something that, you know, it's always been on the fringes here and there in the environmental movement for maybe, you know, four or five decades. But it's starting to creep in in weird ways into sort of right-wing ideologies. Um, You know, we saw... The El Paso shooter, his alleged manifesto included some nods to ecofascism. The similar thing happened with the Christchurch shooter, um, where we saw similar themes play out about who should have access to what type of lifestyles. And so that is basically the gist of ecofascism, and it's very disturbing to see it be you know used to perpetrate mass shootings, and it's disturbing to see it now even more so in a Michael Moore produced film um, advocating for population control. Yeah, and the issue there, and I didn't realize this and is that when we're talking about population control it becomes an issue uh with it comes a racist issue why because i mean so i had the joy of watching this movie um thursday it was my first thing i did on a thursday morning which i, I don't recommend to anyone your to wake fault. up and watch your this. fault you should yeah. know better with your experience i did make some bad life choices um i'm not proud of it but you know what this movie does is you know, it argues for population control. And when we look at who is advocating for this, I mean, the movie is solely focused on getting the opinions of, of white people, mostly older white men. And that's who's advocating for this. And it's not to say, you know, like that I know in my heart of hearts, these people are all terrible racists. But, you know, unstated in this movie is, you know, if these are the people deciding that we need population control, well, you know, who are we controlling? Who is supposed to not have children? Right. Um, and so that's where it starts to get into this dangerous racist territory um, because inevitably, you know, those decisions are things that when they have been made by, you know, white people in power, they've 
resulted in, you know, horrible atrocities. And so against minorities and, you know, or against the Jews and the Holocaust, like there are signs that, you know, when you're trying to sort of play God and limit population, um, inevitably it's not about limiting, you know, white folks um, in the streets and white folks having kids. It's about regulating other people. Right. And because population growth is exponentially higher in, in countries with people who have brown skin versus people with white skin, it's implied. Exactly. And I mean, you know, this is, again, like not to say, like, should we be talking to people about family planning in developing countries? Are there benefits to doing that, um, particularly to help, you know, uplift women out of poverty? Like, absolutely. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's their choice. Um, And, you know, to me, hearing watching this movie, I was like, well, you know, these are the people that want to make this choice. And it doesn't sound like they want to give a lot of agency to the people that need to be actually, you know, involved in the process. Well, the other in the other issue about about population and countries, say, like Africa, I've always thought is while this pope is this new pope uh, is great in terms of writing about in his encyclicals and respecting science and the concern that climate change is, he's also the most pernicious potentially problem because the Catholic Church will will not allow uh, people in Africa to use birth control. I mean, I've said that a lot of times on the air. So if there's something wrong with what I just said, please correct me or, 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 or expand on it, Brian. I mean, yeah, so I'm not a I'm not a Catholicism expert. So although my, my Well being my against Italian birth grandpa- control. Being against birth yeah. control and not allowing for people who are Catholic and black skin you know, in Africa and South America to have access to birth control because it's against their religion. Well I think that's the thing, is it's it's the op- it's, it's sort abortion. of the flip side of this, right? Like it's one of those things where um, you know, people need to be able to make their own choices. It's not up to the Pope to dictate it, it's not up to Michael Moore to dictate it. Um, it's up to me to dictate it. I'm not going to tell anyone what to do um, when it comes to birth control and family planning. And so I think that, you know, that's the problem with a lot of these, with this idea of population control or, you know, with <laughs> that side of Catholicism for sure, is that, you know, it's this really top down edict on these very personal issues. And so that's, you know, at the end of the day, that, that's my, in some ways, my biggest beef with this Michael Moore movie, more than the fact that it just like screws up all sorts of science around like renewable energies is that it just really comes to a bizarre conclusion based on the available facts. And it really is intrusive to very personal decisions, frankly. Yeah. And I want to get back to it, but just a final point. So I'm being clear. It's, it's agreed. It's a, it's, it's about a choice, but it's about giving someone the access to make such a choice in terms of family planning is all I'm saying. Like you have to have access to an abortion clinic, clinic, which is what's being limited in the U.S., much less the rest of the world. So getting back to uh, Michael Moore's film, though, uh, that he that he produced, executive produced, Jeff Gibbs film might be a better way to say it. Either way, what about what it says about renewable renewable energy and the renewable energy industry? I mean, the stuff that it says about the renewables industry and the fact that, you know, windmills are just as bad as fossil fuels and solar panels are just as bad. They don't produce enough power. And when the sun doesn't shine, they don't work and all this stuff. I mean, it's like, it's like listening to this zombie talking points that existed in like 2009 on the Heartland Institute's website. And all of a sudden they're just like given this new life with this progressive veneer. And it, it just couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, these are things that are, you know, these are arguments that were maybe in some ways valid a decade ago And it's clear just based on some of this footage that, you know, Gibbs has been trying to make this movie for a very long time. And, you know, he didn't bother to fact check it for 2020 when he launched is what it feels like. And so, you know, I've seen a number of renewables researchers come out and call just total bullshit on the majority of the stuff he's seeing about renewables. Mm -hmm. And what I find the most frustrating about this is that he also lumps this idea of biomass burning, which is basically burning wood pellets for, for power. Um, he, he does this whole section on biomass burning in the film mm-hmm. and how it's not carbon neutral. It's And the thing with that is that is actually true. And it's actually a really interesting topic. He could have done an entire film on, um, especially because a lot of European countries are relying on it to basically become, quote unquote, carbon neutral. Yeah, Germany, when, right? Yeah, Germany, the UK has the biggest, I think, biomass plant in the world. I mean, they're doing this stuff and it absolutely should be called out and we should be talking a lot more about biomass. And instead, he just does this whole weird thing on all renewables are bad and we should control the population. And it it's the most infuriating thing because the one part of the science he got right is like it, that should be the movie and the rest of the stuff should have just been left on the cutting room floor, frankly. I've made an argument for a long time. Again, tell me if this is wrong, flawed, that 
you know, well, people will say, well, Pete, your solar panels and your Chevy Volt, uh, they make the argument that they are worse than, you know, traditional uh, combustion engine uh, and that the solar panels, uh, you know, uh, took such a toll with uh, in terms of the mining and then the difficulty in disposing these batteries and these panels at the end of their life, that that's worse than fossil fuels. And that's the argument that sometimes gets made. And And I haven't looked at the the entire cycle and the and the economics of it but my argument is generally as we are human beings who require electricity and so you have to find the 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 best sources the least damaging sources all cause damage in different ways consumption human consumption is something that we should debate and discuss but taking a look at the you know this film does a, a bit of that and you you uh, write about the lithium industry's violent toll on land and people in Latin American countries um, there is some truth to this but what would you say about that argument and what this film says or in general about the issue of of uh, the least worst prob- uh, cause of source of energy in human and consumption in general. I mean, I think that what this film points to is, you know, or I guess what it doesn't point to, but what it should, is that, you know, any system that we create can be unjust. The fossil fuel industry can absolutely be unjust, and so can the lithium industry. I mean, to me, what the film points to is the fact that we need to think about the people involved in those industries and the landscapes that are involved in those industries, and how do we best manage them? How do we protect them from those terrible impacts? And so, you know, like when I think about so when I think about solar panels, I mean that's that's the first thing I think is like, well, all right, like if we know that the lithium industry can certainly be really damaging, how do we start to make it better? Um, given that we know we're going to need this stuff for you know decades into the future, and then you know in terms of your Chevy Volt and plugging in, I mean, there's always this argument like, well, oh, if like in the film brings us up where they plug in a, a vault, I believe, and you know they're like, he's like, where's it coming? Where's the power coming from? And they're like, oh, a coal plant, and you know again like. Okay, that's fair. Like we should talk about that, but I think it also points to this thing that a lot of climate researchers talk about, where it's a lot easier to regulate or to cut the emissions down at one coal plant than it is, you know, a hundred thousand cars. And so there's this idea of controlling point source emissions, what it's called. And so you know, that's again, like it just goes back to thinking, like, all right, like it's plugged into a coal plant, gotcha. Like that's not really the answer. The answer is okay, it's plugged into a coal plant. Well, how do we start to think about this building a better system to regulate the coal plant or to get it shut down or replaced by renewables? Um, so, yeah, at the end of the day, like like I said, this whole movie, and I think actually uh, to borrow a line from Emily Atkin, who we both love, in her newsletter today, she mentioned that it was kind of like this lazy freshman thesis or lazy freshman yeah. essay. Yeah. And I thought that was the perfect way to describe it, where it was like, you know, Jeff Gibbs and I guess Michael Moore, but potentially by extension as the executive producer, had some ideas. They found about halfway through they probably weren't right and still tried to kind of shoehorn their argument in. And, you know, the reality is like they had the potential there to make a much more interesting movie and talk about some real issues. And instead they did what they did. Uh, I always like to say, by the way, that my Chevy Volt is plugged into my house with solar panels on it to get around their argument. But the truth is my solar panels don't directly create electricity for my house, like most, they go back on the grid and and become a percentage of the share of electricity generated in the in the community or on this grid, right? I think I have that right. Yeah. But I mean that's still, you know, ultimately as long as I mean it comes back to again, like how does your what is your utility doing? Um, you know, are they right. using that to sort of improve efficiency or are they just saying, oh, people are using more energy, so let's install a new gas plant or whatever it is. I mean, this totally again goes back to this idea that like if you wanna address the issues you got to address the systems in place and so that's you know your solar panels in your house like that's great and i think that that is wonderful that it goes back into the grid it's really on the utility and holding them accountable to make sure that they're not just you know installing more capacity um through gas plants to make more money when they could be putting money into improving efficiency right 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 and so much more but I've taken up enough of your time, and I really appreciate it. This is Brian Kahn. He's managing editor of Earther. And read all of his articles there, all of his posts. Really important. Follow him on Twitter, at BL Kahn. Right now, you will not be sorry. A, a really important journalist for these times. Thank you, as always. Appreciate you joining me, Brian. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks again. Brian Kahn. Did you like him? I love talking to that guy. He's really good at talking. Straight ahead. Got a lot of information. You can access it. He's a great guest is what I'm trying to tell you. Who do you like on the show? Tell me who you want me to get on. I think I've got Tim Wise coming on, John Donvan, Midwin Charles this week. 
and uh, Michael Moore, Christian Finnegan, J.L. Covan, a lot more. Who else do you want to hear? Reaching out to a whole bunch of people right now. I haven't had Laura Coates on, and it, but for a few minutes one day. So I want to do that. I'm trying to get Dean Obidala and John Fugelsang back on. Who do you want to hear? Who do you want to hear? Give me some uh, lady names as well. All right. Too many men. Too many white dudes is, uh, uh, on the show. So let me know who you want to hear. Okay. So now I want to talk with my friend, comedian Ted Alexandro, who is literally one of the most he is probably the most one of the most respected comedians of our time, of our generation, and one of the funniest guys working. And he went on every night and made these Instagram shows. He just talked to the camera and then he edited it all down and it made it a special. The New York Times wrote about it and we had a great conversation. Here it is right now. Guy with got who's got more integrity than anybody I know in comedy, honest, thoughtful, generous, kind down to earth Ted Alexandro on Twitter at Ted Alexandro. Follow him right now. Here's our conversation, which was live on Twitter yesterday. We are live with one of the greatest comedians of our era and a guy whose New York times article I hold in my hand. Ladies and gentlemen, Ted Alexandro is in the, the New York times arts and leisure. Everybody. Hey, Ted Pete. I mean, I, I, I knew as soon as I did the New York Times, yours was the first show I want I wanted to, to do. I wanted to break big on your show, my friend. Look at that, huh? Look three, at that. Three. Congratulations. The new special, everybody can find it right now on YouTube. It's called Stay at Home Comedian, and it was reviewed by the New York Times comedy critic Jason Zineman, or is it Zineman? I never know. Either way, it's a great article, and it's uh, congratulations, Ted. Everybody watching, if you're watching my feed, if you're watching Ted, you probably already know about it, but I, I, I shared it and talked about it. Everybody watch this. Let's talk about it, man. Congratulations. This is huge. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, it's kind of bizarre because, you know, it came about just uh, rather circuitously. I, I started doing these um, these live streams on Instagram Live. I, I was calling them Teddy Grams. I would do them every night uh, as the pandemic was kind of beginning, as this, this new day was dawning on us. Uh, you know, and, and also without having uh, a comedy club stage to perform on, uh, like like so many of us, uh, I was just turning to live streams and I was doing these nightly Teddy Grams on Instagram. And it occurred to me after a couple of weeks of that, uh, that some of the bits I was doing were were funny as I watched them back. You know, I mean, I obviously I, I like to think I'm funny, but as I was watching them back, it occurred to me like, you know, some of these are like stand up bits that could live beyond just a live stream. So why don't I try to edit them together, the, the the best moments, the funniest moments, you know, the moments that kind of speak to what we're going through. And I put together this comedy special, you know, with sort of tongue in cheek. Obviously, it's not a, a big spectacle as we're used to with comedy specials, but uh, I was proud of it. You know, I was like, this is, uh, I'm proud of this work. It's funny. It's good. Uh, so I'll put it out. And next thing I know, uh, the New York Times is writing about it. Sitting in his apartment in Queens, the stand-up <laughs> comic Ted Alexandro counts every cough and constantly is convinced he just contracted the coronavirus, at least he says, for 10 minutes. Then he shifts gears. Oh, I guess I was just belching. This is one of the many jokes about pandemic anxiety in Stay-at-Home Comedian, a bold experiment that represents the first stand-up special of the social distancing era. That's something. This is the first stand-up special, according to one of the top critics of comedy and writers about comedy, of the social distancing era. Does that matter to you? Were you trying to get out first? Uh, you know, it wasn't like a competition in, in that regard, but... I, it did occur to me that it was kind of novel, you know, like to put out a comedy special. I, I was sitting in this very room in this chair uh, and I thought like, you know, in a way it's also kind of poking at the, the spectacle of all of that. And comedy specials now are so, uh, it's so saturated, right? There's a million of them on Netflix and every streaming uh, service. So I kind of thought like, isn't it weird that in a way this will stand out because I'm sitting in my apartment, I can't leave. And uh, it's material, unlike a, a comedy special, it's extemporaneous. You know, it was stuff that I was I was coming up with. 
But after 25 years uh, as a stand-up, you know, you, you're kind of equipped to process things in, in real time and make them funny. So I, in my opinion, you know, that, that's what I was doing. So, uh, yeah, it, it was very organic the way the whole thing came about. And then I worked with my editor, who's done my last uh, three specials now, and uh, he helped me to kind of shape it into a, a whole. Uh, did the following sentence sting in this article? There are funny moments, but fewer than his previous three specials. <laughs> I mean, well, you know, I, I can see it, it seemed of- unnecessary because it seemed weird to compare this something you put together in a few weeks and, and something that is not stand up to something that you would put together over a year or more. And that is stand up. It seemed like a, a, an unfair comparison. And there is no av- availability for laughs because you're alone. But go ahead. Your response to that. <laughs> well, you know, anytime the New York Times is writing about you, you you'll take it, whatever, whatever they wind up saying. So I, you know, of course, your antenna is up for any perceived slight. Like, wait, wait, wait a second. What does that mean? You know, like even in the I think the uh, the headline says uh, it largely succeeds. I was like, what do you mean largely? <laughs> I thought it completely succeeded. <laughs> uh, Al Alexander has an amusingly feline gait that you just can't see here in this type of special. Have you ever heard your physicality referred to so specifically much less as a as feline <laughs> well you texted me that i think when the article first came out yes um it's the yeah, only thing you know, that matters i i actually like i actually like that you know because uh I do have a physicality on stage. I've never heard it described as a feline gait, but I think uh, if and when we, we do return to the clubs, that might be my stage name. All right, final thing from the New York Times article on Ted Alexandro. Alexandro, 51, is one of the sharpest comics working today. Huh. A gifted political joke writer ooh, and loose-limbed adventurous performer. Oh, who has never quite gotten the big break he deserves. How did that, what, what do you think about that? Have you not gotten the big break that you deserve? And by the way, with this special, you get, you didn't even try to make any money. You gave money to an important cause. So what is, what are your ambitions in terms of success and money? And, and, and what do you think of, of that statement? You haven't gotten the big break that you deserve. Well, you know, I, I kind of hear that as that he he's a fan. Yeah, oh <laughs> you know, yeah, he's I, definitely a fan. We all are. Anytime someone says that to me, like you should be bigger or you should whatever, you know, I just hear it as uh, I, I I like I like your stuff. Uh, I don't really like the word deserve, you know, uh, I don't feel like I deserve, you know, like where the hell is my, you know, I deserve more than this. <laughs> um, I don't really think like that. No. Uh, I, I just keep doing work, you know, just like with this special. I keep doing work that uh, that makes me feel good, that I'm inspired by, that like, you know, th- this this you know is kind of a microcosm of the way I've o- operated in my career. Like when something gets a hold of me that I think is odd or interesting or fun, I see it through, you know, and I collaborate with, uh, in this case, with my director, editor Matthew Weiss, and uh, he always does such a great job of putting stuff together. So, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of lucky that I have that, um, you know, I have easy access to see things through to completion. But, you know, uh, I don't know. As far as, like, do I deserve? Uh, <laughs> I feel like I've had plenty of breaks and, uh, and you know, uh, probably more on the way. Who knows? Well, definitely, for sure. And this is a huge one for you to be able to take advantage of the situation that we're in and have success. And everybody is talking about your special right now, uh, which is on YouTube, and everybody's got to watch it, including, I mean – who knows what one deserves or how to measure success, but I think most comics, most artists uh, and other folks, they feel like they've really gotten they've, – they've accomplished a lot when they have the respect of their peers. Look at just a short list of the people who have uh, shared your special. Patton Oswalt, Amy Schumer, Andy Kindler, Dr. Ken, Bonnie McFarlane, and the biggest name in comedy, J.L. Covan now. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I love JL. He does that great Trump impression. Uh, yeah, ev- somebody- all the big name, all every comedian knows who you are and all of the, quote, most well-known comedians probably don't think they're as good as you and that they don't deserve uh, the success that uh, that they have versus, you know, quote, your success. But how about that's, measuring? That's my, that's my real goal is to make them feel like that they don't deserve it. Right. 
exactly. <laughs> Specifically, I think Chris Rock and Jerry Seinfeld, I think you are on your list, the people who don't. Uh, but, but I mean, all of them, all of these folks – uh, showing you the respect that uh, that you deserve for this special and everything. That's that's great. That's got to feel good. It is great. Yeah. Yeah. As you well know, uh, all of the other things aside, when a fellow comedian uh, tells you that they appreciate your work or has some kind words for you, that that goes a long way. You know, I remember like when I was first starting, uh, maybe I was five years in, maybe even less. And uh, David Tell it was like downstairs at the old Boston Comedy Club. Uh, David Tell took me downstairs and we were just having a drink and he just told me that he thought I was funny, like that I had, you know, I had um, something different. And uh, I'm man, you know, like when David Tell tells you that when you're first starting out, uh, that, that kind of buoyed me for the next uh, year or so. Yeah, that's uh, that. That's got to feel good. I have all kinds of jokes as to who else David Tell might have given compliments to that failed, <laughs> uh, but I can't think of it. I don't want to slam anybody. Uh, no, that's awesome. That's really nice. Now, uh, in yeah. your in your new special, uh, there are a couple of moments that I think were borderline offensive. I'll say I was offended when you compared yourself with both Anne Frank and Nelson Mandela. <laughs> Um, and then you 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 basically said that you and your wife and newborn baby boy made safe passage, which seemed like a little bit uh, too high of rhetoric to describe uh, just entering your apartment. Um, so who do you think you are, really, <laughs> comparing yourself to these folks? Yeah, I compared us to the Von Trapp family. Uh, those they missed who one. That's the right. Musical, the sound of music. Um, yeah, escaping the Nazi uh, horrors. But uh, no, I mean, I don't know if you know how comedy works, but uh, sometimes you make ridiculous comparisons. And uh, these were some of the comparisons I made uh, in the moment, like like we said earlier, just kind of, you know, like it occurred to me as bizarre as it is, you know, uh, like not being able to we live in a second floor apartment. Uh, you see, like the Anne Frank thought occurred to me. Now, obviously, it does not apply in any sense. And I say this in the special. I'm like, look, I get it. it's not a good comparison. But, you know, those kinds of things flash into your head. Uh, and same with Nelson Mandela. Like when we finally did get out, I felt such a wave of, of liberation. Uh, I compared it to what... <laughs> To what Nelson Mandela might have might have felt. I Did don't know. you? I think the special dropped on uh, National Holocaust International Holocaust Remembrance Day too. So it seemed really <laughs> insensitive. No, um, the funny thing, the sad thing is, when you say when I you say something like, "Oh, you compared yourself with Anne Frank and Nelson Mandela." That's how comedy doesn't work, but that's how, like, social media works often. Oh, you made a rape joke. No, I didn't. I had a joke with the word rape in it or the joke with, with, with the words Anne Frank in it, but it wasn't – it was a thoughtful, funny, or I, whatever it is. It's just that people take all the, the context out. Yeah, in a way, I'm almost, like, drawing attention to my own stupidity. Like, who would really make a compare? Like, obviously, I don't think that I'm living like Anne Frank during a – a quarantine. Uh, so I would hope that anyone watching, you know, but, there, you know, you always run the risk of offending somebody. Uh, but I, I feel as though when you mention those things, like if I'm doing a joke about, uh, in this particular case, Anne Frank, Nelson Mandela, uh, hopefully it conveys to the person watching that I've I have thought about these people and they, they, they're they important to me. You know, these are important figures. Or if I'm talking about police brutality, you know, joking about that in some way, uh, I've given a lot of thought to these people and to these themes that, you know, if I feel comfortable to, to joke about it, at least in, in my perspective, uh, that, that, you know, I, I, even though I'm joking, that these are people and themes of import to me. And I hope that me bringing them up and acting like it's really controversial will just drive people to YouTube to watch your new special, uh, which everybody <laughs> needs to watch right now, Stay at Home Comedian. So... You you also do something, I think, that is probably unique to this medium, which is at some point you you start talking about your face or a lot, your hair, your moles, your beard, because part of that is probably you're watching yourself as you're making these videos. And you're like, oh, my gosh, th- my moles look like they're talking. Uh, my beard makes me look like a murderer. And there there's a lot there, but it's almost like doing comedy in front of a mirror while watching yourself. You can't help but comment 
on how you look. And I love those sections of the special. Is that, is that why? Because you're looking at yourself, communicating while you're doing it? That's a great point, Pete. I hadn't even really thought of that, but that, that is exactly what it is because you're, you know, usually when you're doing stand uh, your own face and your own look is the furthest thing from your mind if you're really in it. But when you're doing it in a live stream and you, your own face is, is staring back at you, uh, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Like, you know, especially if I'm on for, you know, between 30 and 60 minutes a night, um, yeah, there's those times where, you know, your mind's wandering. And, and I also did this, you know, this uh, pandemic haircut that I refer to as the Crow Hawk, you know, just out of boredom and out of like uh, something to change things up. Yeah, because um, of because of that, because of that, literally after after I sit down, after I do this with you, I'm having uh, Ava. My hair is as long as it's been. And so I'm nice. having my 15 uh, year old going to carve. A lightning bolt, I think. I don't know what she, I don't know why I should have her car, but it's something because I want to be like you. And also, everybody's going to want to be like you and do a similar special where they they riff every night for a couple of weeks and then edit it down. Do you think you're going to see a lot of copycats now? <laughs> I would love that. I mean, if you know, if if uh, people feel that their stuff merits uh, doing that, you know, I think it's a great idea because really, it's. I mean, calling it a special, I think, is what brands it differently. But, you know, you do hours and hours of content a week. Uh, you do podcasts. You know, anyone who's doing this already could very easily uh, accumulate their best stuff and, and, you know, format it into this kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's not that difficult to do for people who create content. But, um, yeah, I guess I am, I'm, I'm happy that I, I – was the first one to do it or think of it that way. How are you and your wife and uh, newborn son holding up in Queens? We're good. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, having a four month old makes every day exciting and new anyway, you know, it's this huge life change. So I'm really grateful that I have this time at home. You know, it's really a godsend in that regard, you know, all of the uh, obvious, all of the sad aspects of the pandemic aside, um, being home with my little boy and waking up with him every morning and, and having all this precious time as he develops is uh, is great. So, yeah, we're, my wife and I are cherishing that. You know, you, you do feel restricted. Obviously, you want to take him outside. You want to take him to a park. You want to do all these things, show him the world. Also, have the rest of my family and friends hold right. him and give him kisses and hugs. So that is um, – that's the hard part of it. Like, we've been doing Zoom chats and stuff like that, but uh, – yeah, but you know, like like with everyone, there, there's uh, it's a mixed bag with uh, all of this stuff. Is it true that sometime you play uh, peekaboo with your son and just put him in your beard? Is that <laughs> that accurate? <laughs> there is some truth to that. He uh, he will put his little hand in my beard and then we try to find it. Yeah, he uh, he really likes he likes the beard, so he gets in there and uh, we do play some fun beard games. He he's he's a good little guy. Why? Why on earth would you decide to not monetize this instead with your new special? You suggested people donate, and I'm sorry I don't have this in front of me. Did, did Zineman write about it in his article? What is this organization and, and um, that you wanted people to donate to, and why not monetize it? Why not – you worked really hard on this. Why not make money off of it? Uh, well, What I is guess... wrong with you? <laughs> Well, as the special, uh, I hope, indicates, I do have my issues with uh, with capitalism and kind of the relentless call to monetize and to uh, to profit off of everything in, in every possible way. Uh, so I, I guess this spoke to that also. And also during a pandemic, when pe- so many people are suffering, uh, I felt it was it was a good opportunity to kind of you know, maybe have the perspective that as much as we all are being inconvenienced or, or perhaps even, you know, suffering if, if folks do have the uh, the virus, uh, there are people in jail. So so I was working with COVID Bailout NYC, which is a grassroots group that uh, bails people out of jail, people who have not been convicted of anything, uh, have not had their day in court, but they just can't afford to pay bail. So they're stuck in jail. The courts are shut down, so they can't even get their trial. During this pandemic, the courts are shut down, and uh, 
and the virus is spreading faster in New York City jails than anywhere in the world. So uh, it could well be a death sentence just for whatever small infraction uh, a lot of these people have committed. COVID Bailout NYC is an organization raising money to get people out of New York City jails. So that's a very thoughtful answer. All right, before I let you go, um, I wonder if you've had any time to think about or if you even knew about this or if you don't want to comment on it because maybe you didn't hear about it, that that comedian Louis C.K. Has, given, uh, ha- has a new special out. He's given $25,000 to this fund that a fellow comedian of ours, uh, Ray Allen, has started for comedians who are struggling without money. Um, what, do you, have, did you know about that? Any, any thoughts uh, about that? Can we have uh, many ideas at once? I did hear about uh, Ray starting that fund, and I thought it was a great idea because, you know, uh, a few people had done uh, fundraisers for the wait staff, which I thought was great for the various wait staffs. Uh, I think Berbiglia had done one for wait staffs around the country, mm-hmm. uh, and that's ongoing. And then a few people had done, um, you know, maybe for the New York Comedy Club and the various clubs around town. And Ray decided to start one for uh, the comedians because that was my thought, too, with all of these fundraisers for for the staff. I thought, well, you know, comedians live a pretty precarious life uh, financially. So I I was um, heartened to see that Ray put that together. And uh, I thought that was nice and generous of of Louis to, to donate. Uh, all right, pal. Well, I appreciate you talking to me today on a Sunday, no less. Everybody should check out the Sunday Times uh, and or online, A Vital Act in, so- in the Social Distancing Era, the article about Teddy. It's so cool, man, to see this in the New York Times. Congratulations on the special. Go watch it on YouTube. Sit down, comedian, right? Stay at home. Oh, my God. Stay at home comedian. That's all right. No, I am sitting. So that's a that was an alternate title. Stay at home comedian. Listen to his podcast a little bit me and go to tedalexander.com. The greatest. Thank you, sir. And I I'm so happy for you. Congratulations. Thanks for doing this. Thanks, buddy. And let me know what uh what winds up happening with the hair. I'm curious to see oh, you'll what see. gets yeah. shaped. What do there. you think about a swastika just as a joke? Maybe swastika with circle and a line through it? <laughs> that- uh, I don't think it's a good idea, but you know, you, you live your life, man. <laughs> Thanks, pal. You got it. Yeah, there it is, Ted Alexandro. Just the best, simply the best. Love him. Okay, final guest of today's show is another comedian friend of mine who is also a father. He has four kids, and I saw his Facebook post a couple days ago where he talked about a situation. One of his uh, his oldest daughters, 24, was staying with them, isolating, sheltering at home with them during this time. But she wanted to leave. She wanted to go hang out with friends uh, for the weekend in Long Island. He's like, well, you can go, but you can't come back. And she snuck out and snuck back in. And it was a whole thing. And it's a real moral dilemma in the time of pandemic. And Adam's a real smart, loving, awesome guy. And so I thought I'd ask him to talk a little bit about that situation and how he handled it right now. I hit record, and now I have my friend, hilarious comedian Adam Oliensis. His new album is Aged Wine. Very funny and a really thoughtful, smart guy. And I saw your Facebook post, Adam, and I and I said, uh-huh. I got I to talk about this with you. We'll tell everybody exactly what it is, but thank you for joining me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Great to, great to be on with you. How's your pandemic going? How's my pandemic? Well, you know, how does a pandemic ever go? Um, <laughs> you know, we're surviving, we're struggling. It it highlights, you know, just like the virus attacks, uh, attacks kind of whatever your sort of health weaknesses are. Same thing with uh, family dynamics and emotional health, I think. You know, the, the stress kind of tries to break down your weak points. Yeah, like, yeah. A really good, you know, like a really good offense in football. <laughs> yeah, you really figure out who you are and who your family members are. Trying to, definitely trying to, yeah. So, what is your uh, situation? Who is who are you sheltering in place with? Who have you been isolating with, and about how long? Probably about the same time, yeah. everybody. But yeah, yeah. Since I, I don't remember exactly the date, but you know, sort of mid to late March it was. And uh, I've got everybody here. I have uh, my wife and four kids, and then my two old. I have uh, kids, twenty four, twenty two, uh, sixteen, and twelve, and then my two. Older kids each have a dog. So there's three dogs, six people, 
and one house. So you're, I mean, those are, that's quite an age range of kids and uh-huh. uh, probably break it all down. But I mean, your post on Facebook, Adam, I thought was really, first of all, um, honest and interesting and important, which is why I wanted to have you on, because I'm sure you aren't the only person who's, who's, uh, who's dealt with this. You wrote hypothetical ethical dilemma. One of your grown children is sheltering in a home with you and other, your other children, your spouse. Uh, quite against your explicit house rule, this child sneaks off to Long Island with a new date. You can't forbid this grown child from going because she's a legal adult. You've warned this adult child, sounds like an oxymoron, but it is an apt description, that if he or she does this, you will not let him or her back in the house and she will not become uh, be, be welcome because he she is putting everyone else in the family at risk. Do you follow through? What other recourse do you have? Thoughts. You got 85 comments on this post and it's really interesting. And so what happened? Uh, well, as, as far as far as the post goes, there was kind of a, a broad unanimity of opinion as to what to do. As far as, you know, I, I guess I can, you know, spoiler alert, uh, what happened was my wife and I fought about this. She she didn't really want to talk about it, uh, but that's kind of a theme. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a little more more sort of in your face than she is. She was like, we'll talk about it later, we'll talk about it later. But So we never really sort of resolved it between us, although I we, we both had some mixed feelings. And finally, my daughter, last night actually, my daughter came home. And when I was out, I was out running uh, uh, another errand. I actually had, coincidentally, I had to go to Long Island for something. So, um, but, but you know, very, not a date or anything where I was risking uh, infection. Um, so when I got back, she was here and she was in her room. So, uh, you know, that was one of the possibilities that like, okay, if you're going to stay here, you got to stay in your room till you either get tested or two weeks, whatever, because... Because we can't, you know, there's a real ethical problem here. You want your kid to be safe. You want your kid to be, uh, but you want your kid to follow the rules and not endanger anybody else. So, you know, my feeling was you can't come home unless you're going to get tested first or unless you're going to agree to stay in your room. But we'll see whether she abides by that. Uh, Now and now she's actually planning to go to California, which I think is a terrible idea because she'll have to fly. And I think it would be irresponsible if she didn't first get checked to see if she's if she's positive. Uh, but the bot, so, but but it's a, it's a tough situation because, like you said, she's an adult, but she's staying in your right. in your house. I mean, is right. I guess where do you you know what was the conversation that you had with her? Was it a long ongoing argument? I want to go out, and 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 you're basically saying, yeah, you can go anywhere you want. You just can't come back here. Yeah, the, well, we had that uh, the the big explicit argument about she wanted to do something else previously. And I said, you know, I can't tell you no. She she thinks I'm trying to control her life. I'm not. I, I She does a lot of things that I would rather have her do differently. And, <laughs> That's very diplomatic. Yeah. and But, but you know, I, yeah. I'll, I'll give her my, like the Senate, I'll give advice and consent. But, yeah. but, but she's really a free agent. So, you know, we got to the point where I said, okay, if you go do that other thing, then don't come back. And she chose not to go. Um do the other thing, but this one she just snuck out with before talking to me. Uh, you know, she snuck out in the morning. I was working, doing something else, and uh, and she snuck out, and and I didn't have any idea she was gone until later in the day, and then I found out. And uh, so, you know, the, 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 it, it's such a, it's such, it, it really, you know, the tough part in life is not figuring out right from wrong. It's figuring out when there's competing rights, mm. and and. And you know she she's my child. I, I I no matter how old she is, I'm compelled to to be protective of her. Um, but on the other hand, I can't do that at the risk of of endangering you know all the other members of my family and me. You know. Yeah, it's so. such a we. I, I I mean honestly, Adam, I thought about this kind of ethical dilemma a long time. You'll do anything. Right. You'll do anything for your child, but but yeah. in this case. If your child goes, chooses to go out and potentially contract uh, uh, a, a virus that is highly contagious and can come home and give it to you, your wife, and your other kids, 
You have right. to choose you, your wife, and your other kids. It's a really ethical dilemma, but you kind of have to make that choice. Is is what I settled with. What are the what do folks? Yep. What did people say in the comments? Was it overwhelmingly in agreement? You know, and by the way, it's also easy for the yeah. rest of us. It's not our kid. Right, right. Well, that that's the hard part. You know, my my wife is a is a you know a sort of lioness of a mother and would do anything to protect her kids, but maybe not as sort of you know sort of uh, heady or considered on on the on the moral front. So so you know, her feeling is you can't keep her out, and my feeling is you have to keep her out. Uh, or at least quarantined, you know, and, and if she doesn't, I told her now, if you violate the quarantine, you're out. And I, I don't want to do that. I'm, I'm just as protective and, and, you know, and parental as my wife, you know, maybe not quite, but, <laughs> but well, you are, but, but in a different way. Yeah. I mean, you, you care about, right. I'm trying to consider the broader landscape. Right. Right. So, so, uh, uh and it, it, all my, 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 my kid raised an interesting point, you know, saying like, look, you know, two percent of people have it, so there's a very small chance I'll get it. And if I do get it, then there's a very small chance that I give it to anybody else here. Blah blah blah. I, I, I just had a, a dear friend whose mother passed away from the coronavirus on Thursday, and and you know it's a terrible, terrible thing. But 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 when she said, made that argument to me, then my I helped me to clarify the way I was thinking about it, which is that yeah, but if everybody acts like you then everybody's going to get it, right? So it's not just like, oh, if I do this individually, right? I mean, it's the golden rule. You have to do what you think it's okay for everyone to do, not just you. And then that's the tough part about ethics. You know, like, you know, you know if, if I just do this, like, if, you know, it's not a big deal. But if, if you say it's, if you just do it, then you're kind of saying it's okay for everybody to do this. And if that's the case, then everybody's kind of screwed. So, so, and and to me, that's the you know the longer term important point uh, in terms of being a parent is like, wait, uh, you know, are are you are you set up to be the kind of person who does the right thing, and and if you're not, and if you don't even look at things that way, then then a I failed, and b you're you're going to end up at some point really screwing some a bunch of people over, and and to me that's you know that's. You know, morality is for when it's hard to do the right thing, not when it's easy. Very, very so, well said. Very well said. So do you just serve her, like leave a meal at her bedroom door and then walk away? I haven't done that yet, but I think that's what's happening at this point. But uh, um, I don't, you know, we'll see, you know, it's still, we're still, you know, in the middle of it. Like, are we going to, are you going to adhere to, now, you know, now this is a much worse quarantine situation for her because she's stuck in a room, not just, you know, kind of on in our house. So, you know, now we've got a quarantine her from us instead of with us. So, and, so uh, I, and I, I don't think she's going to be able to tolerate it. And I think she's going to end up taking off for California, which is a whole nother, you know, you know, does your insurance cover you out there? Right. <laughs> Right. And that's great. You know, also, get sick, you can't come back. Uh, also, the situation yeah. like this creates difficulty in, in your in your relationship with your wife. Right. Because you have. The kind oh, of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's got to be really challenging the situation that uh, yeah. your your daughter, you know, didn't choose to put you in that situation. But by her choices, you are in that situation, I guess. Yeah. No, it, it's it's uh, you know, it it's uh, you know, it's, it's it's like a drama. You find out where the cracks are yeah. in, in the relationship, you know, and it. it and they get, you know, pried open pretty aggressively. So did people say in the comments, which you got like almost 100 comments at least on this post, uh, was it generally yeah. similar opinions as to how to handle it? Was there a wide range of opinion again? Yeah, you know, some people had sort of, you know, creative workarounds like have her do this or do that. But the consensus opinion is you can't you can't just let her back in and and everything's back to pre pre tryst pre pre trip to long island you know and, right. uh, i mean it, it, on the, you know but it was interesting because it's much easier to write that in a comment than to and of it's course. much easier for me to think that yeah. than to implement it well i wanted so to have you on the show because i think that my my catchphrase that i've been using over and over and saying to myself and everywhere i can is you are not alone and i think that there's a lot of other people that are in a similar situation as you where they have a an, an adult age person living with them at home and makes the choices that right. like this, you know, you can't abide by. So uh, I'm sure you're not alone. And I think that you posting that 
certainly stayed with me and joining me on the show to talk about it is, uh, I think, very important to let other people know that they're not alone in a, in a situation similar to the one that you're dealing with. So thank you. Yeah. Oh, my pleasure. You know, there's, there's a weird thing. You know, our parents' generation, they fought World War II uh, to protect us, and, and the millennials are just being asked to lay on the couch and scroll on their phones, which is, it's too which much. is what they'd be doing anyway. It's too and much. they can't do that. It's too so. much. It's too much to so it's ask. It's turning me into a cranky old man. You know? Yeah, yeah. The sacrifice is too much to ask. It's always a great point. Yeah. Adam Oliensis, thank you. Go get his album, Aged oh. Wine. And, dude, you got to come over and co-host the podcast one day. You can sit like eight feet from me. I got a microphone I'll drag out to you, and we'll uh, we'll just go through the news and politics because you're a brilliant political mind. So I'd love to, I'd love oh. to do that. I, I appreciate the, the compliment and the invitation. Let me know when. Let's I'll be there. It. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. Cool, man. Good to talk to you. Too. All right. That is it. How about it? Thank you, Ava, for joining me here on the podcast. Thank you to Brian Kahn of Earther, to comedian Ted Alexandro and comedian Adam Oliensis. And thank you to all of you for listening and letting me spend a little bit of time with you and you spending some of your day with me. I really appreciate it. Some thoughtful, brilliant, amazing, passionate, hilarious folks out there. And I, if I haven't talked to you yet, if I haven't met yet, I'd love to. So reach out and we will connect as so many of you had. And sign up if you haven't already for a paid subscription at Patreon. Sorry to promote and push that so much. It always feels a little icky. You just want to do the work, not market it and promote it. But that is part of the job. And I'm doing all of the job. I see some of these people doing podcasts like once a week and acting like it's a burden. I'm doing five a week with two, three guests, and I'm doing the editing. Come on, lazy people, podcasters, catch up. Thank you guys very much for listening, and I will talk to you tomorrow right here on Stand Up.